So we come to the last of the organ systems, the endocrine system, and the reproductive system. And then, of course, reproduction <coughs> leads to new individuals, and so we'll look at a little with development as well. So the endocrine system <coughs> is with the production of hormones. Hormones are chemicals that the body produces that are important long-term regulators of what is happening in the body. Nervous system, of course, that is your quick message. <coughs> something like, ow, I hurt my foot. Okay, that's something you need to know about right away. But <coughs> then that message is dealt with and done. Hormones are more the ones that say something like, I'm kind of starting to get hungry. <clears throat> Might be getting some food in before too long here. Or, oh, you're getting older, it's time to do some more growing. <clears throat> These types of longer term messages. So we have a number of specific glands, the endocrine glands, that produce these hormones. <clears throat> and they're also specialized cells in a number of organs and tissues that produce hormones as well. <clears throat> Standard hormones are transported through the bloodstream along with lots of other things like the oxygen and carbon dioxide and various other stuff. <clears throat> and then when they get to cells that have the right receptor, the hormone will bind to that and that triggers a response like we talked way back early in the class about with cell communication. Both the endocrine and the nervous system are very important in the overall maintenance of homeostasis. <clears throat> Nerves and hormones can signal, uh, <clears throat> this is getting out of balance here, time to do something, whether it's a relatively quick signal from the nerves or a slower one from the hormones. Also, the two interact with each other. <clears throat> Key players in the endocrine system include certain parts of the brain, which of course also is a part of the nervous system. So we have coordination between the endocrine and nervous system going on there. <clears throat> also, when you get a signal from the nerves, sometimes the response to that signal involves something more extended as well. <clears throat> and so the nervous signal can trigger an endocrine response. <clears throat> Slower response from the endocrine, but that response keeps going for longer. Many times the maintenance of homeostasis, whether it's with hormones or other things, is something of a <clears throat> back and forth negative feedback pattern. Negative feedback means that when something's happening too much, this triggers something happening to push it back the other way, which of course is a good way to maintain balance. Here's an example, maintaining the proper calcium level. Okay, so let's say we're starting out well, we've had plenty of milk, we've got a good level of calcium, but we're, then we <coughs> gorge on ice cream, say, and now we've got more calcium in the body than we should. And <coughs> this triggers a response in the parathyroid gland, <coughs> which is in your neck. It's less responsive, makes less of the hormone. And that hormone is one that triggers releasing calcium into the blood. <clears throat> so less calcium is going out. Calcium is stored, say, in bones and things like that when it's not needed for other chemical processes. Okay, you're releasing less calcium. Calcium might drop low again. <clears throat> low calcium 
That triggers those parathyroids to say, uh oh, need more, crank up more of that hormone. And that hormone triggers release of calcium. So there's more in the blood, maybe bounce a little bit high, but <clears throat> probably not as much as it was to start with, with our initial problem. And so it kind of goes back and forth until it's in the right balance. There are several types of chemicals used as hormones. <clears throat> Some of these are lipids, <clears throat> whether derived from standard fatty acids. You can see lots of carbons and hydrogens here. Eh, a few options, but not too many. <clears throat> Your standard lipid, that's going to be quite nonpolar, mixing well with other lipids, able to move through a cell membrane, but not mixing too well with water with other polar or ionic materials. Steroids, you may remember those as a category of lipids as well. Again, steroids typically have multiple rings made of carbon and sometimes other things, but steroids basically just carbon <clears throat> attaching together. And then you've got various side branches and these different side things lead to different functions of these hormones. There are also some hormones that are proteins or protein relatives. So for example, these peptide hormones, these are small proteins. <clears throat> these over here are ones that are modified amino acids. <clears throat> and these are going to be more polar <clears throat> aren't able to move through a cell membrane, so the cell's going to have to <clears throat> have some way of <clears throat> transducing the signal. This reaches a receptor on the cell surface, and then that receptor has to trigger a response on down inside the cell. These are not going to move through the cell membrane easily. <clears throat> Again, our classic endocrine pattern is for the gland to secrete the hormone into the bloodstream and then blood of course flows throughout the body and delivers it to the target cells plus of course they're playing other cells but they don't have the receptors they, it just goes on past doesn't affect those hormones can also move out through the capillary walls along with fluids and white blood cells and stuff like that, and move into the general body fluid. There are some other possibilities. Rather than secreting into the blood, a cell may release the hormone into interstitial fluid to move around there. You also have what's sometimes referred to as <clears throat> paracrine versus endocrine, where the secretion is targeting only cells nearby, or sometimes even the cell that secretes it is the one responding. So, of course, if it's only needing to target part of the body, then you don't need to send it in the blood everywhere. That can just go into the local interstitial fluid. Again, these hormones are out there in the body, and it depends on the receptors being present in the target cell for the response to be determined. And you've got different cells. Uh, for example, one hormone may signal a general problem that affects many parts of the body. And so several different components there will respond each in their own way for the different types of cells. So again, there will be specialized receptors. These are typically proteins, or maybe glycoprotein, which means a protein with some sugar stuck on it as well. And, and as is true of a lot of our proteins, the function relates to the exact structure of our protein that fits onto the other molecule, in this case, the signaling <coughs> hormone. Okay. Very specific to get the hormones matching with the receptor. 
but there's a lot of chemicals. Some chemicals may end up matching a receptor that aren't the right chemical. Also, there are potential ways to artificially give an extra dose of a hormone. And either of those can potentially cause a variety of problems.